Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it. We know it's being written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing this day. We will be doers of it and see the fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the subject of conquering. God wants you to conquer in all areas of your life. We most recently are talking about conquering in the area of the mind. We must obtain the mind of Christ and we must understand the effects of wrong thinking as we talked about the last time. And today we're going to talk about conquering the spiritual warfare that would come against your mind. This is so important. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, and remember this is the word nefesh, which means soul, and that would refer to the area of your mind as you're thinking in the soulless realm, which would be in your mind, so is he. Therefore, We've got to get our mind in line with the Word of God. It's important for us to get the mind of Christ and have the Word so that we can be ready to deal with everything that would come against us. We talked about the fact that we must get transformed by the renewing of our mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transform, metamorpho, a change into another form, which we know that's the metamorpho is the, like we learned in science class about metamorphosis, which is the change of species from the, butter, the, ca the caterpillar into the butterfly. That's what's gonna happen to us. We're gonna be changed from a carnal-minded to a spiritually-minded, from a worldly-minded, earthly-minded to a heavenly-minded, and that's what must happen. The total renewing, complete change and renovation of our mind to the Word of God, which is what we must have. Now we talked about if we're going to conquer the warfare that would come against our mind, we must master what 2 Corinthians 10, 5 and 6 tells us to do. Casting down imaginations, which are reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Anything that's against the knowledge of God, well, you, don't, you cast that down because you're going to live and walk by the knowledge of God. And you're to bring into captivity every thought. Uh, that's important. To the obedience of Christ, not just some thoughts, every thought. God does not want the devil having place in your mind whatsoever. You're going to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and have it in a readiness. This means to be prepared and ready. You're to be prepared and ready to revenge or avenge all disobedience, which would be all the disobedient thoughts. And that's going to happen when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, if we will govern our mind and get it in line, get the mind of Christ established in us through the Word in us, and keep our mind upon him. Then Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Now you have to understand the enemy is against you. And he will try to work in the soulish realm, and he'll also try to get things in your mind that are wrong, that are false, that are contrary to the word, that are lies, trying to deceive you. Psalms 56, verse 5, speaking about what the enemy will try to do. Every day they rest my words. They want to get to your words, so you speak wrong words. Now all their thoughts are against me for evil. That means the enemy has thoughts that he can bring to you. That means every thought that comes in your mind is not coming from you. It's not coming from God. Lots of thoughts are coming from the devil who is coming at you to try to get you off of the word and bring evil thoughts into your mind. Also, we talked about we must learn to submit our mind to the word and not think after our own thoughts. A very important scripture we saw in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2. I've spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. Why were they rebellious? which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. We don't walk after our own thoughts. We submit our mind unto the Lord and we take every thought captive and we think on the things that He wants us to think on. If we walk after our own thoughts, 
we're not walking in a way that's good. That means the thoughts that come from us, as well as thoughts that come from the devil, they are hindering us from walking in the way of the Lord and they must be conquered. Now, as the enemy tries to come against your mind, you gotta be ready to deal with things. One of the things we must realize and really must take a look at is these attacks that come against you. Well, why are these attacks coming against your mind? There are several points that you need to be thinking about. Is it from past sin, bringing up things of the past? Or is it from present sin that you might be involved now that the enemy's trying to get you to continue to yield to and walk in? If it's past sin, if you have confessed that sin, and if you have received forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness, and you truly have repented from it, then what's the devil doing? He's just trying to bring up past things to condemn you, to put you down, all kinds of negatives, or he might be trying to get you to yield to them again, to give place to them and go back into them. We must be ready to deal with them. Also, we're gonna to have to cast out all the demons that came in from the past sin, because they haven't left just because you confessed your sin and repented and turned from them. They have come in from the open door and they need to be cast out. Everything has to be corrected so that we do not give place to the enemy in our life. Now how about if it's something to deal with present sin? Well then, we gotta make sure we're, we, we deal with things. We can't continue in sin because the demons will keep coming in, the devil will keep on working at you continually, trying to get more bondage in your life. So we need to make sure that we have corrected that area and that we are casting out the demons that have come in from it. Also, attacks may be just coming from the devil to try to take the word out of your heart, so then you won't have the word in your heart to see the promises come to pass, to try to stop your faith from working, to get you into doubt, get you wavering, get you thinking negatively or whatever, or to get you out of hope, which is a confident expectancy that what God will do, what he'll perform of his word in your life. Also, he might try to get you walking out of love. Instead, he'd like you to get angry, have hold grudges, be resentful, be bitter, be retaliatory, have negative attitudes towards people. Or he might try to get you thinking contrary to the word in any aspect and bring lies into your mind. You do need to take a look at the thoughts that are coming to you. Why are they coming? What is their design? What is, trying, what is to, be design, to be accomplished by those negative thoughts coming into you? That's important, so you can understand what's going on. Is this coming from me, maybe? I'm just what I want, and that's no good. Or is it coming from the devil attacking me? Or what is going on? The thing we must learn is to do exactly what Jesus did. How did Jesus conquer the attacks that came against him? And remember, he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. You and I are gonna be tempted as well. And we need to overcome and conquer all areas. Well, what did Jesus do? We see over in Matthew chapter 4. When the tempter came to him, verse 3. The tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He answered and said, It is written. He spoke the scripture, the word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How did Jesus deal with the attack? He gave the answer to the temptation, spoke the word of God that was the truth, and the power of God is resident in it. Obviously, he had his mind upon that, so he had his thoughts in line, and he spoke it against the attacks of the enemy to extinguish that fiery dart. Remember, when you put on the armor of God, the word in you, one of the parts is the shield of faith which will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked that are being sent at you. You've got to be ready to speak the word and to conquer every attack. That's what Jesus did. We go on, verse 5. The devil take him up into a holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it's written. The devil is quoting scripture. Yeah, the devil knows scripture, but he will use it in a wrong way and twist it to try to deceive you. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Of course, Jesus was wise to what was going on. Jesus said to him, it's written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, which was the real answer 
to what he was trying to get him to do, to tempt the Lord. Verse 8, the devil took him up to exceeding high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, the glory of them. He said, all these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The devil sometimes will speak truths. And he was speaking truths because he, the, he was saying here, the fact that all these things I will give you, because he had them. They were already given unto him. In Luke's account, he talks about they were delivered unto me. But now the temptation comes, if you'll fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, Get thee hence, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. How are you going to attack the enemy? How are you going to deal successfully with the spiritual warfare that would come against you? It's through the Word. You've got to have the Word in you. And you've got to be ready to think on what the Word says and speak it against the attacks that the enemy would bring against you. That is imperative. If you just try to ignore something, it's not going to go away. It'll keep working you. If you just try to just, you know, um, well, I'm, just not, I'm not going to yield to that. Any kind of attitude like that in, in your own ability, your own flesh, your own will, your own uh, human nature trying to deal with it. That's not going to solve the problem. You need to release the power of God against it. You need to conquer this with, the, with this power of God that comes from the Word, and you're going to put God in operation to deal successfully. That's why having the Scriptures in you is absolutely essential. We're going to be looking at many specific type of lies that come, a different kind of attacks that would come against you of the spiritual warfare against your mind, and be looking at how we should deal with it. There may be an area that says, well, you, you can't overcome this sin, thought comes. You're not going to be able to overcome this. Well, this is the devil. He's lying to you. Well, what, what's the answer? You've got to know what the Word says and why you would be able to overcome the sin. Of course, why is He trying to tell you that? So you'll stay in bondage to it and you won't overcome this problem, which means it keeps giving place to Him. More demons will come in and you'll stay in bondage and won't overcome and get victory. Romans chapter 6, verse 2. See, so you've got to know what the Scripture says. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If I'm dead to sin... Why should I not be able to get victory over it? <laughs> Where am I dead to sin? In spirit. That means if I walk according to the spirit, I will not sin. But if I walk according to the flesh, where sin dwells in the flesh, I'll sin continually. Or unto a carnal-minded attitude, I'll sin as well. But the good news is, you're dead to sin. and You don't have to yield to this any longer. Verse 7, He that's dead... The old used dead and gone, there's a brand new you on the inside of you, is freed from sin. That means in Christ, you are free from sin. Your spirit is not sinning. The sin is coming from the soulless realm or, and or from the body. So you're freed from sin. That means I can overcome this. These scriptures show I can overcome every sin because I am freed from sin. I'm dead to sin. Now, of course, you have to walk after the way of the spirit. And that brings us to other scriptures you must know. So you've got to know these scriptures, and then you speak them against those lies that the devil would bring against you. Verse 11, Likewise, re likewise reckon your, also yourselves to be dead indeed into sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not only am I dead to sin, I'm alive to God, and God will come on the scene and conquer this attack. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Well, that tells you, if this is a sin that's trying to get you to yield to any kind of lust, this is going to be a scripture you're going to bring up. I will not let sin reign in my mortal body. I will not obey it in the lust thereof. I refuse to give place to it. I will walk in the Spirit. You've got to think on what the Word says. Verse 13, Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So you speak these things and you declare, you do them as well. I yield my members unto God. I do not yield my members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. No way. Verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. That lie that says, well, you're not going to get free of the sin. No, the Bible says, it is written, sin shall not have dominion over me. Therefore, it will not have dominion over me because I am not going to give place to it whatsoever. You've got to be ready 
to deal with it. And what, other scriptures, there's so many different scriptures, but you need to get the scriptures that answer things. We see over in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4, he said, You have not yet resisted on the blood, striving, fighting against sin. Well, we can overcome sin by striving and fighting against it. So I'm going to do this word. Not only are you going to speak words, but you're going to do words. Do what the word says puts the power of God in operation in order to accomplish the victory. So you'll be speaking things, and you'll also be doing things, and you'll also be replacing any of those lying thoughts that come against you. Also, just negative thoughts in general. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, what things are ever true, they're in line with the truth. Things that are honest, are those things that are honorable, giving honor to God. Those things that are just, that are righteous. Those things that are pure and clean. Those things that are lovely, which means they're acceptable and they're pleasing unto God. Things that are of a good report. Things that have virtue or excellence before God. If there be any praise, think on these things. And this is a command. Therefore, any negative thoughts that come, if they don't line up with this, you can speak the scripture. I'm thinking on the right things. I am not going to think on negative things that come against your mind. The devil wants to get to your mind. You've got to be ready to conquer the spiritual warfare that is arrayed against your mind. If the enemy comes along and says, well, you're not going to get the victory. You haven't got the victory before. You know, who's the, why should you get the victory now? He's a liar. You've got to have what the scriptures declare. First of all, we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 37. They and on all these things, we are more than conquerors. It's really not quite the right translation because this is a verb. Literally, it says we are to be conquering completely or gaining a surpassing victory through him that loved us. To conquer completely. That's what we're to have. This is to be absolute conquering. This is a verb, present tense. Not something that you are, but something that you do. You are to completely conquer through him in every situation, always. That's what he wants. So, he says, well, you're not going to, you can't conquer. No, God says that I am to completely conquer in every situation, and I will do it. And then we come over to 1 Corinthians 15. You have the, what the scriptures declare. You've got to know these scriptures. If you don't know them, then you've got to get a concordance out or something and get those scriptures out and find them or have the notes written down. Do whatever you've got to do. Run around three by five cards with them written on them. Do something to have the word before you. Don't try to deal with it in the flesh or to deal with it in your own mind. No, that's just you trying to overcome spiritual attacks with carnal means. It won't work. The enemies won't leave, see? 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory. This is a present tense verb. Literally would say, who is giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the devil says, you're not going to get the victory. <laughs> you tell him the lie. No, God is giving me the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ as I'm putting him in operation. See, you're going to confront those attacks and make sure your mind is thinking on the correct things, and then speak these things to extinguish the fiery darts of the wicked. And of course, you're going to put them in operation by doing what's necessary to see the victory come forth. 2 Corinthians 2.14. He thinks, well, you, you might got some victories, but you're not going to always get a victory. Well, you have this scripture ready. 2 Corinthians 2.14. Thanks be unto God who always... Now, that's not once in a while. That's not win a few and lose a few. Always causes us to triumph in Christ. Meaning we can triumph in every situation. Always. So you've you got to have these scriptures ready. So when the lie comes, you're going to speak this scripture. It's going to extinguish that fiery dart. The power of God is going to be put against that and dealt successfully. Remember, if Jesus spoke the word... What do you think we need to do? The same thing. And it caused these, these temptations to be eliminated, caused the devil to leave him, 
and it'll do the very same thing for you. Many people try to just deal with things in the natural, and that is a mistake. And of course, what's going to give you the victory? Because you are going to put your faith in operation. Let's say you're dealing with evil spirits that you're working on casting out. We see the type shown here in Samuel, 2 Samuel 23, in verse 10, where this is talking about when the Philistines came against Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Aohite, and it says what he did in verse 10, he arose, he smote the Philistines, Philistines are a type of the evil spirits, until his hand was weary. He kept smiting them. You keep smiting them. You don't stop. You keep smiting them, and you do it with your mouth, remember. You war with your mouth. And his hand clave unto the sword. Remember, the sword of the Spirit is that word coming out of our mouth. So if your hand's cleaving to the sword, that's a type of your mouth continually in operation. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. So you're going to do the word. You're going to speak the word, and you're going to do the word. And so you want to make sure you're doing these things to get the victory. See, just speaking against that, that God will give me the victory, and if you're not doing the word, are you going to get the victory? No, you got to you got to know that he'll give you the victory, but you got to put him in operation to get the victory. I am my hand is cleaving to the sword. I am smiting this enemy as I am speaking against him. God is giving me a great victory. You are attacking the enemy as you are speaking forth the word of God against him or casting him out or resisting him or speaking to a mountain, whatever it might be that you're putting your authority in operation against. And you can also see say well you're just all by yourself. No. Uh, there's more there be with me than with the enemy. And there, the, 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 uh, that which is available for me, which all the angels, I can see them as many as necessary come on the scene. You've got to know this scripture. This is when Jesus was in the garden there, and he, or, or he was going to be taken to the cross by these guys. And he said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Jesus had revelation that twelve legions of angels would have been what was necessary to deal with all the attacks of the enemy that were coming with all these evil spirits working through them. Well, you can do the same thing. The angels will come on the scene and smite those enemies and bring forth what God wants for you to deliver you and bring you out of that particular situation. So you got to be ready to deal with things. What about if you are murmuring, complaining, and griping about things? Uh, we can't be doing that. You got to know what the scripture says. You got to be ready to deal with these things. Philippians 2.14 says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. So if you're having a problem, you've been murmuring or disputing, get the scripture out. Think on it. Replace your negative thought of murmuring or disputing. Get this thought before you. Do this. Think on it. Speak it. Declare it. Act on it. I will not do anything with murmurings and disputings. I will do everything unto the Lord and do things joyfully in a right attitude unto the Lord. And also remember what's going to be the result if you don't stop murmuring and complaining and so forth. Look what happened in 1 Corinthians 10.10. 10. You need to know the repercussions of continuing sin. Neither murmur you, some of them also murmur, and were destroyed of the destroyer. <laughs> You're giving place to the devil. He'll come in and get you. So you've got to know these scriptures. That'll be a deterrent. Hey, I'm not going to murmur because I don't want to be destroyed of this destroyer. You've got to have these scriptures. When you have the scriptures before you on problem areas, you'll be able to combat whatever is coming against you by seeing the repercussions of them, by seeing what you're supposed to speak or think or what you should be doing, like in the case of doing all things without murmuring. There are the lines, the thought that comes, well, you'll never be able to please God. You can't please God. Look at all the failures you've had in the past. The devil likes to bring up things of the past. You've got to be ready. That's attack against your mind to make you think that you're, you're never going to measure up. He's a liar. But you've got to know the scriptures. You can't just think he's a liar. You've got to know what the word says. Isaiah 56, verse 4. The last part of this verse says, Choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Well, those are things I can do. So can I please him? Yeah, I can choose the things that please him. And I can take hold of his covenant promises, which is what he wants. 
and see him accomplish everything that he purposes to come to pass in my life. Also, what other else does the scripture say? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Further then, furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, as you received of us how you ought, or how it is necessary, and how you must walk, and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Well, this tells me I can walk and please God. Therefore, I will walk and please God, as I am going to walk in line with the word. How is it? Because of the commandments. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Well, that means if I'm obeying the commandments of the New Testament, I will walk in his ways and I'll please the Lord. So you're going to think on that. And then, of course, you're going to do that so that you do please the Lord and see victory come forth. Also, the same thing about you, the reason for you getting knowledge is not just to get promises. This is one of the reasons why you do things. Colossians 1, 9, you, he wants you filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing. Not only to possess promises, but so you walk in a way that's pleasing unto him. God wants us to be pleasing to him. So therefore, that's why you get knowledge understanding, wisdom, so you can walk in the way of the Word, and that will bring pleasure unto the Lord. You will please Him, which is what He wants. And also, as another scripture that will help you in this area, is thinking that, well, I need to do the things that are pleasing, otherwise it's going to shut down my prayer life. That's right. You may know how to pray accurately, but if you're not doing the things that are pleasing to Him, are you going to see your prayers get anywhere? No. Look what it says. In 1 John 3, 22. You've got to know these scriptures. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Because I prayed accurately? Well, that's part of it. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Therefore, I'm going to have that scripture before me. And those are some things that I need to make sure that I know because I don't want anything hindering my prayers from getting results. See, the devil's designs will tell you some lie, and he's got lots of different designs to stop because he knows all the, what these scriptures are saying, how they're going to hinder you. Remember, he knows the scripture, and he'll try to get you off track. He wants to get the word out of you and stop you from knowing the word, doing the word, receiving the promises, and seeing the victory come forth in your life. Now, how about the thought that comes, well, I just don't want to. I don't, I'm, I'm not going. I don't want to. My will's not set for that. Well, you got to combat those attacks. Thoughts that come, I don't want to. Feelings that come, I don't want to do that. I don't want to pray. I don't want to get in the Word. I don't want to go witness. I don't want to cast out. I don't want to do these things. I don't want to change my attitude towards so-and-so, whatever it might be. No. Isaiah 1, 8, 19 says, If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. You know, that's going to make me think, I better get my will in line because otherwise I'm not going to be eating the good of the land. And then here's the repercussion if I don't get willing and want to do what he wants. If you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured with a sword. Huh. Well, I mean, judgments are going to come upon me. Destruction's going to come against me. I cannot afford to allow that I don't want to or I'm not willing to or I don't, I don't, I don't think I want to do that. No. I must be yielded to everything that God wants for me to do. These scriptures are so important. This is how you're going to overcome every attack. And if you don't have these scriptures, you're probably just getting beat down by the enemy left and right, and you're wondering why nothing's going on all law, because you're not, you're not overcoming these attacks. See, these attacks have a design to take the word out, to shut you down, stop your faith, stop your prayer life, Get you out of hope, get you out of faith, get you off track, get you in sin, get you some way, some, some he knows some, what's going on, get you out off track so that you are not going to see God accomplish what he wants. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that though thou and thy seed may live. Well, that means my choices to do what God wants affects me and my seed regarding having life. Well, we want to make the right choices. I want to choose life. I want to choose blessing. I mean, if I don't choose it, I'm going to end up getting death and cursing because judgments are going to come if we're not choosing the way of the Lord. 
you got to know, you got to set your will to do things. This is a good scripture for those who have some problems with sexual things coming against you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 37. This is the guy that wants to make sure he doesn't get into sexual sin. Nevertheless, he that stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but he has authority, not power, it's not dunamis, it's exousia, authority over his own will. I got authority over my own will. I can't let anything stop me from doing what's the right thing. I'm responsible for the choices. If I yield to this thing that says, you know, don't do that, I don't want to do that, then I'm responsible because I have authority over my own will. And hath so decreed in his heart that he'll keep his virgin doeth well. I decree in my heart and I set my will, no way am I going to get in that sexual sin. And you get these scriptures before you. You've got a will. You've got to set your will to do the right thing so you don't give place to anything that's contrary to the word. That is so important. And we need to make sure we're not dealing, yielding to anything that would take us down the path of sexual sin and, and bring us into bondage in areas of our life. So important. Another thing that we must look at, and that is about our faith. You got the faith of Jesus Christ. Many people think, well, I don't have enough faith. Well, the devil put that thought in your mind. Not God. Why would that be? Because it's not a matter of having enough faith. You already have the faith of Jesus Christ. You got to know that. People all the time think, well, I don't have enough faith. That's not true. It's you haven't developed your faith and, put, and got it strong and put it in operation and worked it consistently. Not that you don't have enough faith. But as long as you'll believe that, you'll keep on you know, going nowhere. You've got to know the truth. If he can get you to believe one lie, you'll just be stuck in that lie. A lot of people out there are stuck in that lie and think that oh, I don't have enough faith, so uh, nothing will work for me. <laughs> it's a lie. Look what it says. I have crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. How can I live by the faith of the Son of God? Because you have the faith of the Son of God already. I do? What is that? Well, you've got to know what the other scriptures say as well. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. Look what it says. We, having the same spirit of faith. It's a spirit of faith. It's not a feeling. I have a lot of people, they have feelings come out of me, have thoughts, well, I don't feel faith. I don't think I have faith. You're not thinking. You're, the devil's got you down for sure, as long as you can keep that thought coming at you. You already have the spirit of faith. So never think that you don't have one. As long as you listen to that lie, you'll, you'll keep you down. You, you, you don't going to see victory. And notice, it's a spirit of faith, and we all have the same spirit of faith because we got it when we got the spirit of Christ. You have the faith of Jesus Christ. So don't ever think that you don't have the faith. And then other people say, well, my faith just isn't working. I, I, I don't see my faith producing the victory. Well, you've got to know what the Scripture says about what your faith will do. So you can combat that lie. 1 John 5, 4, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You're to overcome. You can conquer and carry off the victory with your faith. You've got the faith of Jesus that never fails. That faith will work. If, that is, if you work it and you don't let the enemy have stop your faith from being put in operation, you need to work your faith. Many people say, well, I just believe such and such, but I haven't seen anything happen. Well, because you've got to work your faith. It's not just a believing thing. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 Wherefore also we, always, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. Faith is a work. You're going to work your faith. You work your faith by putting it in operation. Believe in the word and speaking it or and or doing it. You work it. And we are to work it continually. 
I see it all the time with people saying, well, I'm believing God to do such and such. I immediately think, that's good. What are you doing to release him to do it? Well, I'm believing God to heal me. What are you doing to take hold of the healing power of God and to bring it into manifestation? Am um, I believing God's going to deliver me from these demons? Well, that's great. What are you doing to see it happen? Are you casting out consistently? You see, a lot of religious attitudes get into us and the devil uses these thoughts to keep you in this that, that mindset and it's not going to get you anywhere. Look what it says in James 2.20. Wilt thou know, O vain man, which means devoid of truth, faith without works is dead. Yes. I thought I just had to believe. I'm just believing, you know. Believing God will do such and such. Everybody talks that way out there, it seems. Well, that's great. Yes, we believe, and then we work our faith. When you believe, then you speak, which is the work, one of the aspects of working your faith. We need to work it. Seeing how faith wrought with its works, by faith, by works was faith made perfect. It came to perfection to produce results. You got to work your faith. Yes. If you don't work your faith, it won't happen. Notice, he says, see then how by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Yes. This even talks about being righteous. It's by faith plus his works. We need to work our faith. And remember, going back there, you got to know what the scriptures say. Okay, oh, I have a spirit of faith. Great. Well, I'm just believing God's going to deliver me or heal me or provide for me or, or give me such and such. No. Oh, you got the same spirit of faith. What do you do? According to it's written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. I just didn't believe and that was it. Because I believed, I spoke. Why? Because I'm working my faith, putting it in operation. Believing alone doesn't get it done. You have to be a doer of the word to accomplish it. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, but then you work your faith to see it come to pass. We also believe and therefore speak. Don't ever accept that that says that my faith won't work or that I don't have enough faith. What is the answer for what's supposed to happen with your faith anyway? Your faith is to grow exceedingly and become strong, not get more of it. What you have is to become strong. How does something get strong? By exercising it and working it and developing it. Just like muscles, you know, they, if you, you work them, they get stronger. Your faith will get stronger and grow exceedingly if you work it. We got to work it. If you're not doing the word, if you're not speaking the word, if you're not putting it in operation, you may believe the word, but your faith's doing nothing. Remember, it's dead. Faith without works is dead. We must put things in operation. Then other lies come, such as, well, I don't feel like God's with me. I hear that one from people. I don't feel God. He's not a feeling thing. He's a spirit. Yeah. Don't waste your time t making your feelings a barometer of whether God's with you or not. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter what you feel like. Right. It all matters whether what's happened on the inside of you. As God's came on the inside of you and you're doing the word, he'll bring things to pass. Of course, a lot of people have believed that, well, I know God's with me even though he'll, he'll never leave me or forsake me. We've talked about this. You've got to know the ac accurate truth. When he says here in Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave thee or forsake thee, that's a mistake in the translation. Why? If it says, I will never leave thee, that would be a future tense verb. It is not a future tense verb. It is an aorist, which is a simple statement, and it's in a subjunctive mood, which means it's a conditional statement, meaning the way you would translate that is, I might never leave you if conditions are met. Otherwise, I could leave you if conditions aren't met. Same thing with forsake. It's also a subjunctive mood verb. So you've got to know these things. So you just don't take scriptures, that's another thing, taking scriptures that you think answers the problem, and it didn't answer the problem because it wasn't the truth of what you were thinking. 
where it says that in the King James, don't ever follow a translation, English translation, without checking it out and finding out if it's right. Otherwise, you could be leaving a lie, yeah. which is everybody believes, that, most everybody out there believes this. He'll never leave me or forsake me. Not so. It's only if you meet the conditions. Well, if that's the case, is God really with me? He, you know, how, how do I, how do I, I don't feel him. I don't feel his presence. Well, why don't you just do the word and you'll see it happen. James 4, 8, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. If I just do my part, he'll draw nigh to me. It doesn't have anything to do with feelings. If I get in the word, I praise and worship him, I do the things he says, I put him in operation in some way of drawing nigh to him, God will draw nigh unto me. So we need to believe the truth of what God's word says. Back over in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. I love them that love me. You show love towards him by what? Keeping his commandments and keeping his sayings. He loves them, loves, loves, loves you back. Well, that means he must be with me. He, is not, he hadn't forsaken me or left me because I'm doing the word. And those that seek me early shall find me. If I seek him, I'll find him. Well, I have to do my part. See, a lot of times people don't have, they're in the feeling realm because they're not even doing the word to see the word come to pass in their life. No, we don't ever go by those things. And then the thought will come, well, I don't see the word working for me. Well, there's got to be a reason. Because is God failing you? Because basically you're saying, in essence, or the thought that comes, the word's not working for me. God must not, wonder why God's not working for me. It's almost like tantamount to blaming God. You should be doing this, but you're not doing this. It should be working for me. Why isn't it happening? Uh, look at this. Jeremiah 1.12 said, The Lord said to me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten, watch over my word to perform it. God's a performer of his word. He never hinders his word. He will always perform his word if you and I meet the conditions. So any thought that comes and says, Well, the word's just not working, it's not God that's the problem. It must be something that you're doing or not doing or the devil's hindering you and you're not doing what needs to be done to conquer and overcome to see the victory. You see so many people, they th and what do, what do most people out there think? Well, God's in control of all things, you know. Whatever happens must be God. He's not in control of all things. And whatever happens just isn't God. Evil things that are coming you know, that the devil's bringing at you is not God. You choosing wrong things is not God. When am I God allowed me to do such and such? Those thoughts will come in your mind, see? You gotta replace them. No, he gave you a will, you're responsible for your choices. If you don't choose the right thing, things are not going to get done. God's word will always work. So there's, he's never the problem. Don't ever blame God. Any thought that comes to you that make you think that God won't do such or who, why, you know, he's not going to perform this for me, he's a, that's a lying thought from the devil. You've got to know the truth. Yeah. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return void. It shall accomplish that which I please. It'll prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Well, if it's come into my heart, it's going to prosper in my heart. If, it's going to, if it's, I put it in operation, it's not going to return void. It, it's going to accomplish what he pleases as I'm a doer of it. You've got to know what the Word says and be ready to speak that. Other thoughts will come to you and, and say, you know, well, you aren't seeing anything happen because look at the circumstances. Are your circumstances a barometer that God is working? No. We know this. Especially, everybody should know this from deliverance. You start casting out and you haven't seen the change yet. Well, what does that mean? Well, you haven't cast everything out yet. You keep on casting out until it's gone and then you see the change. You may see some changes as you're doing it. Some changes may not come for a long time until you have driven enough out to see the change. Otherwise, if you're doing the word, it's working. 2 Corinthians 4.18, while we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, our focus is in the realm of the Spirit. Any 
things that come against your mind trying to make you think something's not working by looking at it, your barometer in the natural, what I feel, what I see, situations. That's not the way you view things. The question is, are you putting God in operation? Are you focused on the things that are not seen? And are you putting him in operation to accomplish what needs to be done to bring the victory, to overcome the situation, to, to release him, to accomplish something, to put him in operation in your life? The things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. Otherwise, we need to be focusing on the realm of the Spirit. Here's a good example. Romans chapter 4. Verse 18, Abraham had a promise that he was going to have a child, a seed. Verse 18, who against hope or a confident expectancy believed in that confident expectancy that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. If you have a promise, therefore, there's no reason to never Turn away from believing that promise. He had the promise. Against any reason for having a confident expectancy, he believed in it because he had the promise. See, the word produces hope in you, a confident expectancy of what he'll do. If you have a promise, you should always have hope. If you don't have hope, you've let the devil take that word out of your mind. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He's to have a child. He's 100 years old. She's 90. Her womb is dead. That's the circumstances. But I got a promise. He's not going to be weak in faith. I'm not going to consider that. I'm going to consider what the Word says. I don't see something happening. I don't feel something happening. I still have this problem. I'm considering the natural. Do I have a promise of healing, deliverance, victory? Sure I do. Am I going to be weak in faith and look at the natural? No. I'm going to cast out those spirits of cancer and drive them out until they're all gone. I'm going to cast out those spirits of arthritis, whatever it is, and drive it out until it's all gone. I'm going to stay focused on what needs to be done and take hold of healing power to flow in and speak it into being. That's what you do. You don't be moved by circumstances. Remember what it says. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight, or the external outward appearance, or what is revealed to the senses. Because we're operating in the Spirit. Everything is functioning from the realm of the Spirit. The Word of God is Spirit. You're dealing, God's power is operating in the Spirit. The enemies are spiritual enemies that you're coming against and you're dealing with. That's so important. And if you let the devil get to you and you get hopeless, you're not going to see things happen. Psalms 42. This is why so many people, they allow themselves to get down, depressed, down in the dumps, discouraged, and so forth. Psalms 42, verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? So the devil will try to bring thoughts to get you cast down. Feel depressed, feel discouraged, disappointed. You're, just, you're, you're kind of down in the dumps attitude. Why art thou disquieted? You're troubled. You're upset. You might be in an uproar, it can mean, you know. You're, you're, things just aren't, you're, you're not settled. You, you don't have peace at all whatsoever. What's the answer? Hope thou in God. Have a confident expectancy in God. What's my basis for it? The Word. The Word of God. What God will do and perform in my life. So, we cannot let ourselves be cast down in these things. In fact, hope, if you have hope, that is the Word in you, and remember, producing a confident expectancy of what He'll do in the soulish realm. If you are really focused on the Word, then your soul should be anchored nothing's moving it. If your soul's all over the place, you know, well, I don't know. I'm wavering, I'm up, down. I'm, uh, you know, sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. No. Hebrews 6, 19, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul. You're to be anchored, both sure and steadfast. 
God's word will always work. And you need to have hope, because remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for. In fact, we got to have hope. God is even called a God of hope. And of course, what produces hope? Romans 15, verse 4 says, We have, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. The Word gives you hope. That's why you've got to be in the Word. You can't just try to, I, I, I have hope because, you know, I'm just going to have hope myself. A lot of people kind of have, try to have hope in themselves. Hope in, within themselves, just deciding I'm going to have hope. No, why do you have hope? Because the Word, you get the Word in you. I have hope because it's written. Bing, 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 what the Scripture says. I have hope because the promise says that He'll meet all my needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I have hope because I have a covenant with God and He's the Lord who will heal me. He's the Lord who will lead me. Jehovah, you know, Jireh, the one who will provide for me. These promises that we have. Verse 13. Now the God of hope, he's the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. See, the devil will try to take away your hope. Discouragement, getting kind of down, depressed, kind of troubled, in an uproar. Anything that takes away your peace. Frustrated. I'm just not seeing anything. Get you to think that. Don't, don't say that. And don't think that. Replace that thought. God is at work. I am putting him in operation. I am conquering the enemy. Now, if there's some things you need to correct, you need to correct them. You know? Because you may not be seeing things work because you're not doing what needs to be done. So there needs to be some correction in areas. But you're to be abounding in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. In fact, you're to be filled with all joy and peace in believing. Amen. If you lose your joy and your peace, what happened? Uh, the enemy got to you. The warfare was successful against you. We need to conquer all spiritual warfare against your mind. Don't let the devil pull you down. Don't let thoughts get to you and sink you or get you troubled, or get you upset, or get you frustrated, and so forth. And you can tell if you really got some problems, if you, certain situations come up and you react, yeah. you know? You react and get upset. You react and get kind of angry. You get to react and, you, you know, that's the way you just react, like something little pushes your button and here you are. Uh, you know you got some bondages there. Those are areas where you need to really tromp on casting out and correct those areas and get, take those thoughts captive instead of, sometimes you, you, don't, you don't even think about it, it just happens. Those are areas where you got some real bondage that needs to be cast out. You've got to get the word in you to get you so established so you won't give place to that and just reacting it. See? We need to get our mind filled up with the word of God. That is so important. Also, the enemy, he of course will try to get you to wonder if the word is really going to work or not to get you to waver. James 1, 6, let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Why would we waver if we know we have a promise and we know God will perform the word and we know what to do? Most of the time because people really don't know what to do. But if we know what to do, we should never be wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. He's over, all over the place. And what the, what's the result of that? Let not that man think that he shall lambano, is the word for receive, take hold of anything of the Lord. If I'm wavering, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> That's right. It isn't going to happen. In fact, what's the problem? A double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. It's hard sometimes for people to admit that they're unstable, but that's reality if you're wavering. I mean, let's face it. Get, throw the pride out the window, you know, and think, I, I'm, I'm unstable. I've got to get this in order here if I'm wavering. Amen. We should be constant on the word, steadfast, abounding in hope, confident expectancy, knowing exactly what God will do in every situation. And then the enemy will come along and, you know, I'm, I don't have the confidence that this is going to come through for me. <laughs> You've got to be ready to tromp on that and stop that thought from penetrating and getting a hold of you. 
that you don't have the confidence in the Lord or the confidence that this will happen. Immediately, the scripture should come up to you. The Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep my foot, thy foot from being taken. Being captured, this means. I'm not going to get captured. The Lord's my confidence. I'm going to triumph. I'm going to overcome. The enemy's not going to get to me because the Lord is my confidence. I have confidence in Him. And of course, anything that tries to make you think, well, you know, you can do it yourself. <laughs> that old thought comes. No, that's not going to work because confidence in the flesh is a failure. We are the circumcision that worship God and the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus have no confidence in the flesh. Anything of the flesh is not going to make it. It's all going to be in the Spirit, by the power of God, with the authority, with the faith of Jesus. You're putting in operation. You're used, putting God in operation, not anything of the flesh. You need to get that turned away. Now, of course, the enemy attacks your confidence. Well, I've been trying this. I've been working this. and uh, It just hadn't worked. Oh, the devil's getting to you. You cannot let that happen. Hebrews 10.35, cast not away therefore your confidence. Never let your confidence go. Now if you need to correct something, you, I mean it's fine to say, okay, where am I not on track? Or what do I need to get straight? Or what do I need to know that maybe I don't know? Or where have I been giving place to the enemy that's th why things aren't working? Don't ever think, well, I, I don't see what, it's not working. No. God always performs his word and he never makes any mistakes and everything is going to be accomplished. Every promise is true. He's no respecter of persons. What he'll do for one, he'll do for all. If he delivered one, he'll deliver all. If he healed one, he'll heal all. If he prospered one, he'll prosper all. He can set you free from everything. Don't cast away your confidence. It has great recompense of reward. You have need of patience. This is steadfastness. Remember, steadfastness is how you possess your soul. In our steadfastness, we possess our soul. Oh, that means this guy hasn't gotten it straight in his soul. He's not got his will set. He's not thinking correctly. He must be letting the emotions kind of get to him. Something in the soulless realm is taking him down and getting him to lose his confidence. No, we're not going to cast away our confidence. We have need of steadfastness. After you've done the will of God that you might receive, carry off, commitzo, the promise. That's right. We've got to be consistent. Well, I say, I haven't seen anything happening. Well, another thing you've got to know, long-suffering. We can't be slothful, but follows of them through faith and not steadfastness here. It's not hupomone, it's macrothumia, which means long-suffering. Translated 14 times, 12 times correctly, long-suffering. Faith and long-suffering are inheriting, not inherit like it's already mine, is an accomplished fact. That's not what it says in the Greek. Because the word inherit is a present tense. That's why Young's translates it, are inheriting the promises. It is a work in process that is ongoing to possess them. So you keep working your faith with long suffering in face of the circumstances that haven't changed yet until you see the result. That's why that's so important. Faith, steadfast in the soul, long-suffering in spirit is essential if you're going to see the victory. If he can get you to throw in the towel because you haven't seen it happen yet, you, got, you lost your long-suffering. What a mistake. We can't do that. God made promise to Abraham. He could swear by none no greater. He swore by himself. Surely blessing all blessing, multiply and all multiply thee. So that after he had patiently endured macrothumio, after long suffering, he obtained the promise. You always need long suffering. You keep it going, you keep your faith applied, you keep on doing the word, you keep casting out, you keep resisting, you keep speaking to the mountain, you keep praying the prayer of faith, taking hold of the promise, you keep interceding, you keep binding, loosing, casting down, you keep doing all the things that we do. The steadfastness in the soul and long suffering in spirit you'll obtain the promise. You'll see it come to pass. That's what we need to do. We cannot let the enemy have place. These are areas where he works against you. Another one is rejoicing. 
Well, I'm working my faith, but I sure don't have any joy in this thing. Well, that's a mistake. Joy protects your faith, and you need the joy of the Lord. Philippians chapter 4. Remember, Philippi was the place where Paul and Silas got thrown in jail. Looked like it was all over. Could they have joy in the midst of that? They have to have joy in the midst of that. The joy of the Lord is your strength, which means a fortified place of protection because without your joy, you're going to get sunk. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. That's a command. And again, I say rejoice. Boy, he's really emphasizing it to them. Imperative. Continually. God wants you rejoicing all the time. Well, I don't feel like rejoicing. Look at my situation. Why would I rejoice? On and on and on. Thoughts. Well, I haven't seen what I want to see come to pass. and I can't rejoice. Yes, you can rejoice in the Lord at all times as you're putting Him in operation. You are commanded to rejoice in the Lord always. Is it a feeling thing? No. Isn't that what happens with most people? I don't feel like rejoicing. You get a tax. You need to rejoice anyway. It doesn't matter what the situation is. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Rejoice evermore. Yeah, no stopping that one. You just keep the rejoicing going. Well, I got all this attack coming against me. How can I be rejoicing in the midst of that? Well, look over here. 1 Peter 1, 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice. Rejoice exceedingly, this word means. Though now for a season of need be, you're in heaviness through the manifold temptations. This guy's getting barraged with his temptations and he feels heaviness. Is he going to let his joy go? No, God says, greatly rejoice. You need to keep that rejoicing spirit about you. Don't let the enemy take you down. Well, that means you have kind of got yourself focused off of him. You're now moved by the temptations, the heaviness, the situation that's coming at you. A lack of joy takes you right out of the spirit, see? It's the trial of your faith. It's being attacked. Being much more precious than of gold that perishes. What's precious? Not the trial, but the, your faith. <laughs> Though it, your faith, be tried with fire. See, the enemy will try. That's why it says, count it all joy when you're enveloped with all these temptations. It's the trial of your faith. So you might be found to praise, honor, and glory at the appearing or revealing of Jesus Christ, whom not having seen, you love, in whom though you see him not. Is he doing anything out here? Here, I see you're operating in the spirit. You should be. You rejoice, you, yeah, believe me, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Have you learned to rejoice in the midst of any situation? Or do you get sunk by whatever wind blows, feeling, thought, situation, circumstance? Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation or deliverance of your souls. Keep the rejoicing going. We also see it well while we're over here in 1 Peter. Look what he says. Boy, this trial just beat me down. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. It's just the devil showing up. Rejoice in so much as you're partaker of Christ's sufferings. Can you rejoice in the midst of persecution? Or attacks? Or do you get blown away every time something negative happens? We need to rise above it. God wants us to rejoice. James 1, 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall. Oh, fall. This means to, to be, fall is to be encompassed by diverse temptations. What's happening? Knowing this. You've got to know what's going on. The trying of your faith. It's, it's working It'll bring into operation your steadfastness. That is, if you don't let your faith go, or you don't let your, the soul you know, sink, so you're not steadfast anymore. And you need to let steadfastness have a perfect work that you might be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Don't be moved by what comes. Rejoice. 
maintain your joy. It's an attack against your faith. Don't let it stop your faith. Don't let it stop you from praying. You keep on. Apply. You're operating in the spirit. Well, why should you be so surprised that attacks will come against you? Of course they will. Don't think it's strange the fiery trial is going to come. That's the same thing we talked about before. These people that say, oh, I'm starting to engage in spiritual warfare against these principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and all of a sudden I got attacked. I wonder why that is. Because you were making some inroads against those spirits, and they, they're counterattacking against you, because they they're trying to shut you down. <clears throat> so does that mean, oh, I won't do that, as many have believed and, thought and taught. The devil tricked them, that's for sure. No. You engage much more. You make the battle stronger and you stay on the attack against them. Because you're making inroads against them. Since when the devil's attack gets you to back down and give up and quit? That's crazy. Think about it. Did Jesus back off any time if anything came at him? No. Are we to back off? No. Never. We press forward. We will get the victory. We go through and do the things that he says. We're going to conquer and overcome. Nehemiah. People know this verse, but they really don't know it like they should know it. Nehemiah 8.10. The last part of the verse says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. The word strength doesn't mean I have strength in the man, like physical strength or something. It's the word ma'uz, which means a fortified place of protection because it's protecting your faith. The joy of the Lord will be your fortified place of protection. That's why you rejoice regardless of what's coming at you. Not in the circumstances. Not in what the enemy's doing. You rejoice in the Lord because you're putting him in operation and he is on the attack to destroy your enemies and everything that's coming at you. And he's working to bring your promises to pass. He's working to deliver you. That's why I can rejoice. Obviously, if you're not rejoicing, you lost focus on the Lord. The enemy got you down. He beat you down. He tricked you. He got you into the natural. He got you into, the, into looking at the circumstances. Instead of focusing on the Lord. See, that's what happens. Many people like that and they quit praying. Huh. Well, we should be never quitting praying. If you quit praying, you know what's happened. You've sunk. You've been sunk. You fainted. Luke 18, 1. Men ought or is necessary and must always to pray and not to faint. Thoughts of fainting and giving up, feelings, all this kind. It's not working. If it's not working, why isn't it working? What do you need to correct? Or what do you need to keep doing? Or are there certain things that you don't know yet that you need to learn? But one thing's for sure, your faith will always give you the victory. God will always perform his word. He will always conquer all of your enemies. Every mountain will be removed if you do what is necessary. Every bondage will be broken. You can be totally victorious. And if you quit praying, you must have thrown in the towel and fainted. Because if you understand what you're doing, what are you doing when you're praying? You're putting the power of God in operation. You're putting Him in operation. Why would you stop? I got overwhelmed. I got all those feelings. I got this negatives come against me. It just was too much for me. That's the devil's made some inroads. We got to learn to rise above that. If you're going to come full of power and full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom and full of faith, you're going to do, learn these things and you're going to conquer all the spiritual warfare against your mind. We're not going to let the devil do this stuff to us. We are going to overcome in every situation. That is what you must do. Look at what it says over in Isaiah. As they go forth. How do we go forth? Just barely hanging on? No. Isaiah 55, 12. You shall go forth with joy. 
and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break before you with singing. All the trees of the field will clap their hands. Praise God, you're going forth. Everything's going to be great. God's going, you're going to put them in operation. Joy and peace. If you lose your joy and lose your peace, you're in trouble. The enemy has got to you. Same thing, you get weary. Well, I get, kind of got weary in doing these things. I've seen people quit deliverance because they got weary because they didn't see it happen when they thought it should happen, how they thought it should happen, you know. Well, I've been doing this for such and such, and I haven't seen any results or whatever, so I'm, I'm stopping. God tells you to cast out all the demons and keep doing it until they're all gone. Since when are you stopping? Well, I haven't seen the victory yet. Are they still coming out of you? Uh, yeah. So why would you stop? They obviously aren't all gone. You continue on, right? You stay in the attack. Isaiah 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Aren't we running the race? How, why did we stop? <laughs> the devil got to us. Because if we're obeying, we're running the race and we don't stop. Remember, he says, I'm running after the goal of the award to the victor of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Remember that, Philippians 3? We're running. We're running after this stuff. They shall walk and not faint. That's what we're going to do. We're going to overcome and see God bring the victory in every area of our life. That's the way it is. We're not going to be weary. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 13. Finally, brethren, be not weary in well-doing, in doing well in whatever aspect it might be. Don't get weary. Keep doing it. Be consistent. Whatever you're doing, don't give up. Don't back off. Is God pleased if you draw back? No. In fact, what does he say? It's quite a statement in Hebrews chapter 10. Over here in verse 38 says, The just shall live by faith. And we're going forward. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. God has no pleasure in people that draw back. We can't do that. Anything that tries to get you to draw back, the devil's made some inroads. We are not of them who draw back, and look what it says, unto destruction. That's what the word means, perdition or destruction or perishing. <laughs> wow. I'm not about to think about running, going backwards, because I'm not going back to perishing or destruction. But of them that believe to the saving, preserving of the soul, because where have you given place to draw back? In the soul. In your will, on your mind, or you let your emotions get to you. It just overwhelmed you. That's why you've got to get the word in you. If you get blown away by things, you haven't, got, you haven't got the word strong enough in you. The word will strengthen your soul. So you can deal with things and not get blown away by whatever happens. We've got to rise up. Remember Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. It says, we'll go back two verses. Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's bad news if you're sowing bad stuff because you're gonna, get, you're gonna get the repercussions. He that soweth to his flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. Yeah. But he that soweth to the Spirit, which is what we do, shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Why do people not reap? Because they faint. The devil, they didn't conquer the spiritual warfare. It came against them. It's against their mind, their will, and their emotions. They got beat down. We can't allow that. You've got to maintain joy. You've got to maintain peace. You've got to maintain walking in love. You've got to maintain walking in faith. All the fruit of the Spirit need to be operating. Long-suffering. Every one of these things. They're all so you can function and see God accomplish everything that He purposes for you in your life. Praise God. Well, we've begun to talk about this tonight. We've got a lot more to talk about on covering many other areas 
of spiritual warfare that comes against your mind. Say this, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, thank you and you. I thank you and praise you for the Word of God, Word of which, God. Is the truth, which is the truth, and I thank you that I, know that I know that you watch over your Word to perform it in my life. You will always perform the Word of God if I have met the conditions. I realize the enemy will attack the soul. Spiritual warfare will come against me, especially against the mind. I will not let the enemy have place. I will take every thought captive. I will cast down every reasoning, anything exalting itself above the knowledge of God. I will cast it down. I will do what the Word says. Any feelings, thoughts, or desires that come into me that would cause me not to do the Word, that is the enemy's attack. I will conquer the spiritual warfare, not in the flesh, not in my own willpower, not in my own mindset, but with the Word of God. I will speak what the Word says. I will think what the Word says. I will do what the Word says. I will act on the Word and put God's power in operation to conquer the enemies, extinguish the fiery darts, and see the victory come forth. I thank you, Lord. I will take a look at the attacks that come against me and think about why have they happened. Are they over past sins or present situations? Whatever they are, I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to get the Word in me. And I'm going to act on the Word and get strong and walk in the ways of the Lord and overcome. I will not allow the spiritual warfare coming against my mind to prevail against me any longer. I will rejoice. I will maintain peace. I will put my faith in operation. I will take my thoughts captive. I will think on the good things. I will guard myself and do what the Word says. So I overcome. I thank you, Lord, that I am a conqueror. And I will be completely conquering every attack coming against my mind. I will not give a place to anything trying to get me to sin. I thank you, Lord. I will be a doer of your word. And I will see the conquering of all the spiritual warfare coming against my mind. Because I'm a hearer and a doer of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. You do this, you're going to see big time changes. Take a look at the thoughts. Take a look at the, how the enemy's been getting to you. Are there areas where you need to correct? Are there things you need to change? Are there things that you, you don't quite know yet, or you've got to get straight? Are there areas of the Word where you really don't have the Word in you and strong yet? Have you caved in to the temptations in the past? Have you gotten weary? All these things. Uh, have you kept the rejoicing going? Or have you the rejoicing? <laughs> I don't know what it means to rejoice, you know, because you've been blown away by all these things. Well, we're going to turn it around. We're going to do the Word. We're not rejoicing in what's the circumstances. We're putting the Lord in operation and rejoicing in Him and putting Him going forward. And we know He's going to give us the victory. Amen. See, you get this corrected, great things are going to happen. Father, I thank You and praise You for all that You're accomplishing. Thank You that we'll be hearers and doers of this Word. We're going to conquer all this spiritual warfare against our mind. The devil is not going to wear us down and pull us down, get us to faint, throw in the towel, give up, on and on. No more. Thank you, Father, that we will get established in the truth and we will see the promises come to pass. Thank you for bringing forth victory over all spiritual warfare because we'll be hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.